Good morning, all. Deep, good to talk to you on this stage. We had an interesting product conversation just a few days ago. Um, so I'll just actually look. Uh, we'll, we'll continue the same conversation. Uh, I, you know, just just last week, Deep, I went through the series of essays you have published. And uh, I mean, those of you who don't know my background, I worked as a product manager for almost five, six years before starting Mintra. And I think I was the kind of first product manager in my first um, two startups as well. So I think of myself primarily as a product person. Uh, but for me, you know, going through the SS Deep was uh, quite illuminating. You know, it was the entire product journey, especially from a startup from day one, how you think about who's your first product manager, first product leader. So first of all, I just want to commend you for taking the time interviewing all those experts and putting it down. It's a outstanding resource. I think I'll be heavily recommending to everyone that I work with who's interested in product. But I want to start with what was your motivation? You know, at what point did you realize that you want to pen down and put in all this effort to articulate everything you know, you know about product management? Uh, must have obviously taken a lot of effort. So how did this whole thing start? Yeah, th thank you for the kind words, Mukesh. And you know, like yourself, my product journey has been uh, very long over almost 20, 25 years before I became an investor. And I've spoken about product on this particular stage in this room a couple of times in the past 10 years as well. And you know, that those kinds of conversations were really the motivation for both first starting uh, a product management class that I used to teach at Stanford. And that didn't have enough scale because you could only teach 30 to 50 people at one shot. And then, you know, just having similar conversations over and over again. I figured that I should spend the time to write it down. And it does, you know, it's shocking if you're not writing PowerPoints and if you're writing Word documents, how much longer it takes. <laughs> so <laughs> it took probably my co-author, Tom Eisenman, who was one of my professors at Harvard and myself, about eight to nine months between the in-depth interviews we did with the various product leaders, putting down our thoughts, my experiences from time at Google and LinkedIn uh, to write nine essays. So it's roughly a month and essay. Uh, incredible, right? And I think this was um, probably basis, you know, the what you have experienced. I think you work with a lot of early stage companies, a lot of product companies, and you interviewed also a lot of product experts. So I imagine a lot of what you end up writing in the series of essays was familiar to you, intuitive, but probably some surprises as well. Like what are something maybe you didn't realize until you articulated that which is, you know, something that you want to pay more attention to going forward as you have product conversations with people? So, uh, you know, one of the essays we wrote was about technical debt. And, you know, anyone here who has a company is a product manager or engineer. Have you heard the word technical debt? How many of you, like, you are saying it with a smile. How m does it evoke a feeling of happiness when you say it? <laughs> no, right? So, <laughs> it, it's, it's a bad word, clearly. It's a bad phrase. And it sort of gives us nightmares. But as we started talking to product leaders about managing technical debt, some of the insights that came out, I thought were a little bit counterintuitive, but made a lot of conceptual sense. The first is you should actually welcome product uh, technical debt during the early phases of building your product before you have PMF. Because there's no point writing beautiful code, the most perfect code you can, before you know that code is worth anything. You should just get it out there. And once you get it out there, the challenge is that debt, at some point you have to repay it, and how do you account for repaying it? That's some of the things we talk about in the essay, but that was a counterintuitive thing and something that you know you wouldn't think about. Uh, and and do, would you think about uh, technical debt differently in a startup context where you're trying to build a product from scratch and product market fit is the most important thing versus let's say an enterprise context where you have large contracts, you are building product for somebody, how should you think about technical debt in that context? Uh, there is always going to be debt, right? Code becomes obsolete and uh, it cannot ever be perfect the moment you write it. The key question is how do you handle it? So that's, that's one part, which is you know you need a product, you're building it, and if you are in the early stages of company building, you'll write whatever it takes, but then you, once that product hits, now you worry more about scaling it. You're like, oh my god, I thought I'd get like 100,000 users, all of a sudden I have 1 million, now I have 10 million, and you're like busy scaling bad stuff. That's like saying, you know, you have a foundation for a house that can only go up to two stories, but now you have like, you suddenly had lots of children, now you want a 10 story house and you're like, oh, what do I do next? So one of the maxims I always tell people is, you know, you build for 
1x, you engineer for 10x, and you architect for 100x. So that way, you are not expending the energy to build you know, a 20-story building in anticipation you are going to have lots of users, but at the same time, when you need to, you can, but you don't incur that expense up front. Sometimes, just, just uh, you know, one more point on technical debt, sometimes you incur it when you least understand it. And that's when a massive shift in technology happens. So let's imagine you had built an enterprise software system 20 years ago, and it's working just fine. And it's got all the right code, all the right features. You don't need to make any changes to it. And suddenly, now, you have to be in the cloud. So that's a big shift in technology. You have to redo everything. And now you've incurred debt. And then this last question on technical debt. Who is the owner of technical debt in the company? You know, sometimes what I have seen, <laughs> it's just there. And it's no one's business, you know, like the debt that countries keep incurring. It's like somebody, future generation will pay. So how do you solve for that? Uh, the owner is the future engineer you've not hired yet. <laughs> <laughs> or the youngest and the most <laughs> inexperienced engineer who you'll be like, Isse kaam sikhoge. go fix some bugs here and f you know, fix this thing. I, the old maxim is success has many parents uh, and you know, technical debt is not viewed. And this is the other counterintuitive thing. If you really want to address technical debt and take care of it, you should be giving it to your senior most, most experienced people to deal with because they have the context of how it was incurred. They can do it better and maybe you know, assign some younger, uh, more novice engineers to it, more as an apprenticeship model, not as a punishment, but as a learning opportunity. So l let me just uh, come to early stage, but that's the context I am most familiar with, right? So uh, when you start a company, you know, one of the most important thing for you to achieve in first year or two is product market fit. So in the first part of the first letter is product. But you know, most startups when they start, they don't necessarily have a formal product manager job. You know, sometimes the founders think they have enough of an idea about a the product. They may or may not be from product background. In fact, if you scan large number of companies, majority of founders are not from product background. How should people think about product management in that, you know, very critical phase of company journey? Without product market fit, there is no company. Right. But sometimes, you know, again, it uh, becomes a community project in terms of what goes in. So what's the right way to think about this? So uh, I'll answer that question, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. You came in as a product manager, you started Mintra. How did you think about the product management role? So I was lucky in that way, you know, I had product background and yeah. uh, I would back myself, you know, so I was a product manager, you know, yeah. for definitely for Mintra for many, many years. And even for CureFit, you know, for first few years, I would be deeply involved. But by that time, I think I was trained as a product manager. I had a point of view. And I had also the conviction of, you know, just taking calls and backing into the field. But that was the luck part, you know, I could have been from very different background. And in that case, you know, and, and work with startups, I invest in startups where I see that, you know, the founders have maybe a vision and a point of view, but don't have the product skill set. And I'm not sure, you know, whether I should advise them to hire a competent product manager right away or develop product skills, you know, even act like a product manager and learn on the job I mean the, because founders will be deeply involved. They can't outsource the product market fit journey to somebody else. That's right. So what I would say is that, you know, until the time you get product market fit in your company, trying to bring in new people to give advice uh, is probably less productive than it can be. So you definitely do want to wait until you get PMF because what is the product manager going to do uh, otherwise, they should be one of your co-founders, right? <laughs> they are really, most companies are the product that they build. And if we don't have an idea of what product is going to be built and we need somebody else to come in and do it, they're probably like a co-founder, you know, whether they come in six months in or not. So that's one thing. The second one is you can be an engineer who has a good sense of what you want to build. And especially if you're building things in open source or dev tools, so very technically driven things, you don't need product manager per se, because you have a good sense of what needs to happen, but you reach a critical mass where, as the CEO, you also have to do other things, the founder CEO, and then your you know, attention starts getting divided, and then it's a question of who do you need. So the construct we have in our, you know, one of our essays, by the way, we keep referring to it, if you want to look at them, they are at deepnishar.com, so easy enough to find them, or, or on LinkedIn. Um, the construct we have is, do you want a poet or a librarian? Okay. 
the poet is the creative genius. Like they are thinking of strategy, they're thinking about what the thing looks like, et cetera. And sometimes, you know, a founder may need it. Usually most founders are poets, let's be honest, right? Because they have the vision, they have the passion, and they're thinking beyond the obvious. Uh, the librarian takes your vision and catalogs it. They're very good at execution, and they know exactly how to take your thoughts, put it on paper, and make the trains run of time. So a great example of this is Meta, right? Mark Zuckerberg is the quintessential poet, and he's always had a very big hand in the product strategy of that company. We know this time and again, and he's always surrounded himself with people who are very good at being his you know, yin and yang together. I, I don't think... Chris Cox would like to be called a librarian necessarily, but the, the role that he excels it at is to take the product strategy from someone like a Zuck and you know, really translate that into something amazing that reaches billions of people every day. So Deep, you know, um, you know, when I moved back to India in 2007 and the first phase of all this company building, you know, when you're building Mintra and Flipkart and Ola and so on, one of the lament among you know, all the founders will be that there are really no product management mm -hmm. talent. Now, ecosystem has evolved a lot in the last 15 years. I think this forum itself has done, I think, a lot to promote that ecosystem. So probably two-part question. You know, one is where do you think we are? You know, you work with a lot of product managers in Valley. You've been one, you know, for longest period of time. Where do you think we are in Indian, you know, ecosystem in terms of the maturity and sophistication of product management as a discipline? And second part of this question is, you know, what do you do to, like, what's the best way to train somebody to become an outstanding product manager? Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. And also, uh, sort of the foundational reason why NPC, right, the Na NASCOM product conclave was formed in the first place is to make this into uh, a skill and something that people would aspire to do and be trained to do. Because product management is essentially an apprenticeship business. Like, you have to learn from the very best. And if you don't have great role models around you, who are you going to learn from? So I'll give you an anecdote, because uh, I was running uh, Google's product organization across Asia Pacific, and I helped start the R&D centers in Bangalore, in Hyderabad, in Shanghai, Beijing, in Japan, et cetera, in the 2006-2007 timeframe. And if I look back, so this is now 17, 18 years ago, if I look back at the product managers that we hired for our operation in India and for our operation in China, it's actually a pretty bifurcated view. So first thing is we try to hire folks the same way we would hire them in the US, which is like get them from the best universities, create an APM program, et cetera. And we found that it was harder to do that because we didn't have senior people who could act as their role models and mentors. So we transported a few people from our US operations, both in, and China had the same challenge, by the way. So we would hire from Tsinghua there, we would hire from an IIM or an IIT here. So we ported over some senior people from Mountain View, both in Shanghai and Beijing, and in Bangalore and Hyderabad here. Fast forward 10 years, most if not all of the folks that we hired in India and who was the earliest product managers have gone on to do amazing things, right? Like they are CEOs, some have gone on to be heads of product in different places, but in the US, they all moved over. In China, on the other hand, not only did they stay, Pinduoduo, the key founder calling Wang, was one of my PMs in Shanghai. The person who started Papaya Mobile there, Si Shen, she was one of my product managers. She was actually an APM in our program. Uh, Xiaomi, you know, one of the nine co-founders of that. These are like multi tens, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of companies that they formed. They stayed there and they found that. So they built that ecosystem behind them. We unfortunately, you know, that little ecosystem did not develop. Now, on the other side, People like you and Sachin and you know Naveen and Benny and all of the folks that were starting companies in the same time frame, Bhavish, you have built the ecosystem here and you've learned on your own and you've built, I think, amazing things. But we could have had a multiplicative force that did not happen here in India. And so how does one, you know, I mean, there is obviously no dearth of talent in India. And you know, today, I mean, younger folks are talented, driven, ambitious, and so on. But product management is still um, kind of art and science, which requires apprenticeship over a period of time. What, is, what are some of the things you know, that Indian ecosystem could be doing to accelerate you know, that journey? So uh, you use the word accelerate, and I would almost say you need to have patience. Mm -hmm. So they almost feel like you know, oxymoronic terms, right? Sitting next to each other. 
but it's, it's like the karate kid, right? Like you're, you're just washing this way and then washing this way for a while and you're like, where's, where's my karate uh, experience that's coming into play here? It's a lot of learning by doing, it's a lot of learning by observation, and it's a lot of learning by truly getting into the mind space of your targeted user and customer. Like you remember our Starbucks uh, air purifier conversation, right, from a few days ago. Uh, having that mindset, and that mindset comes over time. Right? It doesn't come all of a sudden. And then creating environments like these. Uh, and I know there's the Institute of Product Leadership, like we saw the stall outside. What are the places where people can hang out, learn from each other, debate and discuss, not with the intention of like getting the next job or the next project or the next startup, but just talking about things like why, you know, why did Bisley decide to make the bottle this way? It's a real question. This is, you know, like we Indians love to pontificate about politics and everything else. So at least they did when I was growing up here. Let's pontificate about products that we see in our everyday life, and and maybe we'll accelerate our learnings about what makes the world tick. So maybe you know, uh, the you know, creating their environment and context. Well, company culture has a a role to play, and generally, you know, each company has some kind of core DNA. Some companies are very product centric. A lot of, you know, valley companies tends to be that. Uh, companies can be very sales-centric, you know, uh, operation-centric. So when you interact with a company, let's say in a growth stage, mm. what are the signs you look for? What will, you know, just talking to the CEO, founder, top management gives you indication this company really cares about product? That, again, you know, another very insightful question. And you also have to recognize, you know, as an investor, we have to recognize uh, what kind of a company culture you need to be successful in the space that that company is being formed. So if you are predominantly selling into enterprises, you can lead with product, but having a commercial viewpoint and truly understanding what is it that your customer needs and solving that need is actually the higher order bit. You could have the most beautiful, incompetent, unuseful product, like <laughs> no one's going to buy it because it looks pretty, right? Like th this bottle can look very pretty, but if it's not very functional. So you, ne you need the function more than the form. The form is important. Uh, and you know, gone are the days when enterprise software used to look very clunky and very poor and people would accept it. Now no one accepts that. Like you, you want a notion like experience. You need an Asana like experience, et cetera. If it's a consumer product, you know, I definitely look for people who, who are very much in tune with the form because the function sort of comes and sometimes the function is driven and it's beyond the imagination of the target user. So, you know, I'll give you another example like that sort of stuck with me. When uh, we were building the products for Asian markets, one of the things we saw was in Korea and Ch uh, in Japan in particular, people didn't like just the Google search box. And in fact, in Korea, when we did user studies, they said, you know, this website seems to be under construction. You're like, what are you talking about? Like, Google's been around for, you know, 12 years by now, and we have hundreds of millions, if not billions of users. They're like, yeah, but how can a page that just has a box and a cursor be complete? And, you know, you have to, like, pause and think about that. And when you go out and if you go, you know, stand in Seoul at a busy intersection or you stand in, you know, Shibuya in Tokyo, you know what what they mean, like there are flashing billboards everywhere, right? It's like Times Square in every corner. And that's what they are used to in terms of uh, the completeness of a product. So that's one side of it. So we built like a bunch of things with like not flashing buttons, that would be very non-googly as they would say, but you know, more features on the Google homepage to at, at least demonstrate to that user base that more things would happen. And so we go, and at that time, we used to have these famous uh, GPS sessions at Google called the Google Product Strategy Sessions that Larry and Sergey would attend. And we would you know, present all of our new ideas there. And we presented, and Sergey asked the question that he always would ask. He's like, what is the latency of this page? And the latency was higher than the threshold that we, we set Google-wide, worldwide. And you know, the tech lead in the meeting started to give the reasons why, saying, you know, these are the emojis, there are more pixels, we got to paint the screen, this is why this happens, etc. And Sergey just listened and listened and, you know, didn't say anything, which just meant one of two things, either you're not making sense or he didn't believe you. And then he looked up from his computer 
And he said, you know, I just went into the source code, I made these five changes, I think it's a lot faster now, and I think if I can do that in 10 minutes, you can do what we need to do. <laughs> that is the mark <laughs> of a product-centric CEO, founder. That's company. a very high bar for founders to <laughs> aspire for. <laughs> Oh, but are, are you saying you're not getting into the code base of your companies, Mukesh? I'll, I'll think about it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Inspired. Okay, just changing track, Deep. So last, you know, I think about maybe six, seven years, you have been kind of switched over to you play a, a VC hat, you know, with the SoftBank now with General Catalyst. So from the just overall venture ecosystem from Indian perspective, you know, there is I mean, a lot of money has been pouring in and it uh, accelerated, you know, in 2021, hit a peak, I think something like, I don't know the number, but upwards of $50 billion were invested in Indian companies in that year. And things have you know, slowed, slowed down considerably last year and this year. And there's a little bit of, it seems like it's some kind of funding winter. But I think in my interaction with you, I've noticed that at GC, you guys are looking at you know, India very seriously. And uh, so what is this overall take on you know, where we are in terms of just you know, the venture dollars deployed, what is likely to expect, you know, how to play out next two to four years, where company, you know, looking to raise money, et cetera. Just, you know, over what's your perspective? What's happening in India and what kind of, you know, uh, given the, the interest rates are, you know, going up. So, you know, money is becoming quite expensive in that backdrop. What to expect in Indian, you know, you investment perspective over the next few years? Yeah. And I'm sure that's on the minds of many of the founders or people contemplating starting companies in the room. Uh, the one thing I would say, which is, uh, it's sort of like a law of physics is a law of business, which is, Good ideas and good companies and good founders get funded no matter whether it is summer, spring, winter, or monsoons outside. Monsoons for the Indian context. There are no monsoons anywhere else. Uh, so the question we have to ask ourselves if we are not getting funded is, you know, which one of these three things may be missing in what we are pitching? Now, there are times when uh, the market is flush with investment dollars, in which case sometimes, you know, if one of these three things is missing, people can still get funded, but eventually they have to make up for it because these are the three key ingredients of a successful company or at least the precursors of building a successful company. So you have to fit it somewhere or the other. So 2020 and 2021, there was a lot more, there were a lot more dollars chasing uh, companies and you know people are willing to overlook that. Today they're not overlooking it. So from that perspective, you can say it's winter, but I don't think it's winter for the right companies and the right founders. Uh, with the right idea. So that's one. The second thing is you do have to, you know, there are two areas right now that I believe are like very fertile because they are tectonic shifts. Uh, the first one I talked about here almost five or six years ago, uh, in fact, which is computational biology. That has changed our life substantially worldwide. And in every way we can think of, the food we consume, the medicines that are uh, being created to treat a variety of ailments, uh, obviously, you know, other kinds of things like materials, et cetera. So literally in every facet of life, a lot more than just our laptops and our phones, right, which is what other technologies do. I still don't see many companies coming out of, uh, of India in that, and, you know, that's a place where you can get great funding with the right team and the right ideas, and you can make a really big impact and difference in the world. The second area, which everyone's talking about, but I haven't really seen uh, too many companies coming out here, is generative AI. That is the next shift. If you're starting an enterprise software company today, and you are not thinking how you'd build it with generative AI and generative AI alone, you're dead in the water. Like, you should just stop thinking about it before you even start your company. Because if you think about enterprise software, you know, you strip away all the f form of it, and you look at the functionality, what is it? It's a database with a very specific data model that is tuned to that particular use case with a bunch of forms and fields on top. And we fill out the fields, and the forms give us workflows, and then something happens. So if you want to file an expense report, you go through, you type in a bunch of things, you upload your receipts, someone looks at it, they approve it, so on and so forth. Now, take generative AI use case. You don't need a data model, you can just use unstructured data. So that core piece of IP is completely gone. So you can just upload that receipt, you don't have to say anything about it, you don't have to fill out the fields with the money, you don't have to fill out the fields with the comment field and which department it should go to, et cetera. 
and you just tell it, get it approved. And then it can go through and look at your company's you know, approval process and say, okay, this was $30, it was lunch, it is well within the you know, per diem that you are allowed to have, you had it with a client, as a result of that, we should get a tax benefit for it, we will account it appropriately in our ledger entry, and boom, it's all done. No AP person has to be involved, no AR person has to be involved, no tax person has to be involved, and so on. So now all of a sudden, if you are building Concur today, you'd build it very differently. I'm not seeing any of those companies here. So if you but had those two things, there would be no winter. Yeah. Fair, but you know, uh, I was also hoping that you will, maybe your perspective on your next few years, is over the total quantum of dollars, hmm. uh, is likely to increase, like you stay at this level for some, like just how to think in a macro perspective. Let's assume eventually entrepreneurs will figure out interesting opportunities. There's no dearth of, you know, people wanting to build a company, but generally in the larger macro, you know, things, you know, what is the level of excitement and bullishness about, you know, where India is situated from venture? So I think India has, India has two things going for it, which, uh, you know, everyone in the room should really capitalize on. The first is the quality of the people and the second, third generation of entrepreneurs that are coming out. So the quality of companies and the audacity of ambition that people in this room have today are very different than what I would see 15 years ago, 20 years ago. That is you know, really important and foundational. The second is the world is now polarizing between China and non-China, which means a lot of investment, like pretty much every non-China based investment fund is hesitant if not already stopped investing in China for a variety of reasons, right? Either governmental pressure, regulation, ability to take money out of that, the Chinese ecosystem, et cetera. Well, those investment dollars have to go somewhere. Investment firms over the last 10 years have gotten from their LPs quantum of dollars and quantum of uh, capital that is substantially higher than what they used to get prior. So all of those dollars have to be productively deployed. Of course they will get deployed in the US, of course they'll get deployed in Europe, but they'll also get deployed in markets like India. So I don't think dearth of investment dollars should be an issue for anybody here who has a great team, a great idea for a great market. I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, and this, despite, you know, the funding winter, I think 23 is still, I think, higher dollar invested in 2019. And I think it's only going to accelerate, right? There's right. no question. I think since, you know, uh, I think there is no panel discussion is complete without AI, and you've touched upon generative AI already. But I want to ask you, you know, since so AI has obviously hit the peak of high cycle this year, there is nobody who is not talking about AI, but it's, we, but, what is the concrete evidence we need to see on ground in terms of transformational products or projects which shows us that AI is finally here? Because I, at least I am not seeing, you know, if you ask me to point to an evidence where their AI is starting to meaningfully, there is, and you know, AI is not new in many ways, you know, Google Maps also use a lot of AI, mm -hmm. Facebook Newsfeed use AI, so that is continuous incremental improvement. Correct. But what are the examples that you will see where, you know, that will convince you that you know, this new wave of uh, this large language model based AI is tra starting to transform our lives. So you're absolutely right. Like again, to set, set the stage, you know, one of the things I always say is that innovation is not a silver bullet. It's many lead bullets that come together and eventually we observe it as a silver bullet many, many years, sometimes decades later. And the same thing has happened with AI. 30 years ago, people were working on computer vision. People were working on machine learning techniques. We were working on, you know, at that time, GNN, genetic neural networks. Then they became, you know, RNNs and GANs and all kinds of things. What has happened in the last five years, especially since the, you know, seminal paper of attention is all you need, uh, five or six years ago now, is we made a step change in algorithms. We made a step change in compute. And we have a lot more people who are well-versed in these techniques. So Google, you know, DeepMind, Google Brain, has over 2,000 AI engineers, and these are like world-class, very high caliber engineers. When I was at Google, like, we didn't have that many people who understood that level of AI. So those three things have come together that is giving us this step change right now. So that's one part, right? So it is here, it is here to stay, because when you have so many smart people who have all the capabilities, always great things happen. Then what are the signs that we look for, and what are the signposts that we are seeing? The fact that ChatGPT was, you know, got to 100 million users in like less than 30 days tells us something. 
right? It may not have stuck, and I don't think they have 100 million users today necessarily, but it tells us that people are finally ready and it became very accessible to just about everybody, right? This morning we were talking and you turned around and told someone, hey, why don't we check what ChatGPT tells us about this? It's become that thing. Like, if I was a Google search product manager right now, I would be worried because people now have a choice yeah. to ask that question. And, you know, like, it's not going to go turn over overnight. So that's one part. Mm -hmm. The other part is you look at uh, the earnings calls of every major corporation and the number of times people talk about generative AI there, it's like, I think, Fortune 500 calls, it was like 85 or 90% in the last two quarters alone. So it's definitely top of mind for people. How does that translate into real dollars? It depends on people in this room, right? What are the products we are building in order to convert that desire to buy into an actual action to buy? And so people have need, we have to fulfill that need. So that's the second part. The third part is a lot of the usability of these new models is already happening in what I would call the modern legacy companies, okay? So, you know, historically the legacy companies were always like the big industrial houses, Honeywell, Siemens, maybe you consider IBM into a legacy company, et cetera. But the modern legacy companies are the ones that were formed in the last 20, 25 years. It's the Googles, the Facebooks, the Atlassians, the ServiceNows, the Salesforces, they are all using it in their products. Now, they may not be, some of them will be cutting edge and world class, some may be like just below that par, but if you use any of those products, it's already there. Your TikTok feed uses generative AI. Your Insta Reels are using generative AI. It's there, it's pervasive. Excellent, so you're saying, you know, it's just all around us, it's just that we are not seeing it, you know, in the, in, let's say, chat GPT form, except, you know, in the search form, but many, it's just already embedded in a lot of algorithms and systems. Screen is informing us that time is up. So Deep, I just want to take a moment to thank you. I think you have incredible wealth of knowledge around product management, company building, culture building, and so on. And it's great that you keep finding time to come back to India and keep inspiring and educating, you know, next generation entrepreneurs. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>